What's up, you guys? Henry Gracie here with my friend Bear Kitugua, uh, the owner of Shoyuro Jiu-Jitsu, um, Gi's, and lifestyle brand. And uh, thanks for visiting, bro. Thanks so for we, having me. We met today, and he was like, Henry, I want to come down. Let's have an acai bowl. We had our acai bowls. And let's talk about the state of jiu-jitsu in America. Where is jiu-jitsu currently? Where is it going? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Um, so, man, we went kind of deep. And uh, we wanted to let you guys in on a little bit of, of what we discussed. And, um, you know, starting with maybe you want to take him down a little bit better in terms of the direction that we discussed, in terms of the challenges that we see right now with jiu-jitsu in America as it's currently being taught and shared all over the all over the country. Yeah, I think we were just kind of talking that, you know, most people that go into most jiu-jitsu gyms have a hard time sticking because a lot of gyms sometimes bring them in a little too heavy. Yeah. And sometimes they might be scared, they might get injured, they might get beat up. And you were talking about how people that you know and love, you have trouble and you are jiu-jitsu. Like this, this, you know, this guy's been around for as, as long as I've been around jiu-jitsu. And people that you know and love, you even have trouble recommending them to train at a BJJ school. Many of whom he has incredible relationships with because of the long-standing success of the brand. Um, but you hesitate to recommend someone to jiu-jitsu. 100%. Yeah, I think it's, there's very few gyms. There are some gyms that do it better than others, but sometimes, depending on where the person is located, that gym that's around their area might be pretty tough, whatever it may be, there, however they run their school. So sometimes it becomes a little challenging that if they're closer to me, I might be able to control a little closer, but if they're out in a place where I don't know the instructor or gym or curriculum, then I might have a hard time recommending people. And that's the challenge, right? The fact that you can't recommend someone to Jiu Jitsu, the martial art that, you know, was so enthusiastically, you know, brought to life in Brazil by, of course, the grandmasters, Elio and Carlos, their sons in Brazil brought to America as the martial art that was truly designed to empower the weak against the strong. But that's not so much the case anymore. If the weak can't go to a gym to learn Jiu Jitsu because of how the art is being taught, then where do we stand with the martial art that gave us all so much? Now you survived jujitsu, and you know a small percentage of people survived jujitsu. Barely, barely, barely. <laughs> but uh, and I survived the 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 way it used to be done. Right when as I came up, it was not like it is today in terms of how we run things, and it's just sad that the people who need jujitsu the most right now, today in America and even around the world are not welcome in jujitsu at 99% of BJJ schools. That's sad. So what do we do? Do we just ignore the fact that it was developed by the small and the weak and designed to empower those people against the monsters of society? Do we ignore that that was the origin of our art? and just kind of fall into what it is today and accept where it's become? Do we do the best we can to try to revert back to making the art available to those people who need it the most? What do we do? And I, really every instructor in Jiu-Jitsu has their own choice to do what they do. And for us at Gracie University, it's 100% clear. Everything we do is to make sure that Jiu-Jitsu continues to be accessible, not just in proximity, but in practice, accessible to people who need jujitsu the most. If you're the most athletic, toughest, baddest guy that you know, you know, you could benefit from it. You'll love it. We all love jujitsu, but you don't need it as bad as the small, weak, unathletic, timid souls of society, right? The people who don't otherwise see themselves as powerful people in the physical sense or even any other sense. So everything we do is to make jujitsu, right? And that's how we reach, you know, thousand plus students, almost 1500 students here in Torrance at one location. And I told them, I said, the only way that we do this is by making jujitsu safe, structured and sensible. And what I mean by that is it has to make sense to the beginner. How many times does a student show up today at a BJJ school by a very talented world-class instructor and on the first class, they're learning something that they have no idea 
Bro, you laugh, bro. You tell them. Don't tell me. <laughs> You're here laughing. You got to be honest. It is. It is. And then how do, what goes through that student's mind? Or what are you, what is someone thinking in that situation? What do I do? What the heck are we doing <laughs> here? They're thinking what type of twisting, turning, switching, upside down, inverted, sweep, lapel, feet around the neck twice technique is this? And what context, right? Where in this, where in my life does this actually apply? And it's their first class. You've seen it, bro. Don't lie. First class, first week, first month. That's all they see. Maybe after year two would be okay year one, maybe. Right, maybe after, right. Maybe after well, six months. Well, maybe, here's the deal. Maybe, maybe after, after we conquer the initial concern. What's the initial concern for someone learning jujitsu? I think it's to not get beat up. Simple. Go out there, set a boundary, assert yourself, protect your family and your loved ones, and be able to physically not go to the hospital in a street fight. But if the first six months of their training, all they're learning are things that they can't even put into context for their own lives to be applied in a self-defense situation, what are we doing? Jiu-jitsu, someone shows up and the first day they're learning a technique that they can't even pronounce or recall the next day because the context was so warped based on the school's definition of victory because there's a competition in two weeks and we have to get that student ready for that competition in the two weeks so that they can go as a white belt and win their medal. So we're teaching them something that, although it applies in that competition, has no applicability in their everyday lives. That's part of the warp here. So I don't know what to, yeah. Well, I know what we do to combat this and I know the success that we've had and, um, you try to tell because you're not a jiu-jitsu instructor, you're a black belt, but you interact with some of the top instructors and, and competitors in the world. So what do you try to tell them when you see them 17 years into their career and they have 110 students in their dojo? What do you, how do you advise these people? What are you talking? What's the conversation like with these guys? Because you've seen other ways because you started at the Gracie Academy in, in the original Gracie Academy on Carson in early 2000s. He's been training with us way back then. So what is that conversation like when you talk to these big dogs? Well, I think it's hard to talk to someone that has their business already set, right? Interesting. So I think that's hard, but I think ultimately, I think if they could structurally do stuff that's similar or learn principles from the Gracie Academy, you know, a bunch of other affiliations are starting to do stuff mm. similar probably, or getting inspired by the Gracie Academy, right? Um, and I think like once gyms start to build a better beginner program so curriculum, crazy. I think more people will stick with jujitsu. And if they want to teach them sport, jujitsu, or more advanced rolling jujitsu, whatever you want to call it, three months, six Which months. Which we do once they're ready, <laughs> right? The fact is this, like, and I was telling Bear this, that in the old Gracie Academy, there was no group classes in Brazil. It was private classes. There was one teacher, one student. We would train for 30 minutes. Your class was done. You'd go home, come back the next two days later and train again. When we came to America in the early uh, 80s and 90s, that's when group classes started getting introduced. The problem is that group classes in that setting, there was no real history teaching group classes. So now you went from a teacher and a student, I would guide you perfectly with the techniques that you need as a beginner at your intensity and with the right self-defense emphasis for you to protect your family. And then once we have a group class, I go, all right, Chris over there, Bear over there, you guys both have 12 classes. We're in a group class in Torrance now. This is how we began here. You two just pair up and do the technique. And you guys are killing each other because you're both beginners trying to prove who's the baddest. And then at the end of the class, it's like, all right, well, we need to spar. So you guys just roll. So now you have two beginners trying to rip each other's heads off and they don't even know enough to do it safely. When me and he don't spar, it's the safest thing in the world because we know how to move our bodies. But when you have two beginners trying to kill each other in a beginner class, it's not safe for anyone. But that's the whole point is that Gracie family has this long history of privates only in Brazil coming to America because of the economics of it and because of just the logistics of having so many students and so few instructors, we had to do group classes and that's where that thing started. And then it just kind of took a life of its own and now you have all these beginners leading beginners and trying to kill each other in group classes and most schools in America today still do that. Where it's like, here's the move, figure it out, boom. And then it's like you beginners roll. You have three classes, you're kind of strong. Go with that guy over there, he has six months. Go, and he'll, his technique will neutralize your strength and figure it out. And then the guy who's brand new and athletic, 
gets his arm tweaked and doesn't want to come back anymore because he's only three classes in, why would he subject himself to that? So all by way of saying, what we have tried to do is to replicate in group settings the same safety, structure, self-defense, gradual and appropriate progression through jujitsu for each student, even though we're doing it in group classes, we tried to emulate the, the, the priorities that were prevalent when they were only doing private classes. And that required a lot of changing to how group classes were taught here at the Gracie Academy in the early 90s and 2000s. We had to change everything how it was done. And because we were successful, beginners now stick. They stay with jujitsu. When someone shows up, my expectation is that 95%, 100%, 95% are 100% committed to the journey. Now, logistically, they move, they can't afford it, something happens, fine. But most people stick, whereas right now, most BJJ schools, it's the opposite. You get five or 10% who stay, who survive, the remaining 90% gone. And we'll never give it a second chance because it was so unpleasant. And then I get the DMs, you've seen them. They DM me like, Henner, I had three classes. I cracked my rib. What should I do? Where should I train? I'm like, I don't know, bro. You know? Well, you know this. How, what, about, what about 10, 15 years ago when there was no beginner or advanced class at 90% of Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Academy. They, they didn't even split it up. They just they all students together. That was what, 15 years ago? Crazy, right? yeah. But now a lot more gyms. Some gyms will split beginner advance. Yeah. But even in the beginner, it's survival of the fittest. And to me, that's where the whole thing falls on its face, you guys. So anyways, I just thought it was a powerful collaboration to kind of talk about him because Ian Bear's interest is like, yo, he wants more people training jujitsu because it's his industry. It's lifestyle, it's brand, it's geese, it's amazing apparel. And for us, I want more people teaching jujitsu because it's my family's legacy. But it's so sad to me when someone starts jujitsu and then completely falls out of love with it because the teacher did not create an environment that was conducive for the learning of a small, weak, unathletic, disempowered member of society. If you're not attracting and keeping those people, you're not doing what jujitsu was intended to do. Now I'm not saying you're not allowed to do what you do because legally you can do whatever you want. I'm just saying there's so much more jujitsu can have. And the problem is within jujitsu, do you agree that like the people who are deep in it, like they think it's the whole world. <laughs> they think everyone's in it. But the reality is how big is our industry, jujitsu, the practicing industry of jujitsu? It's like a drop in the bucket, you guys. It's like the smallest little nugget. Hundreds of millions of people could benefit from jujitsu that currently aren't doing jujitsu. And the question is, how do we get them in? We need a little change. We need a little change. A little adjustment. Some little tweets. safety, little structure, little you know consideration for how to streamline it in a way that keeps those people that are, you know, not the athletic animals of society and keeps them on the mat. And if you're one of those schools who says, no, if you can't hang with jujitsu, jujitsu is not for everyone. You're wrong. You're, 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 how do we say the word? You're, um, uh, it's not, you're objectively incorrect in that assessment because if anyone gets to determine the, the purpose of jujitsu, it's the grandmasters. You don't qualify to come in today, even if you're a black belt and say, no, if you can't hang, jujitsu is not for you. What you can say is if you can't hang, this school is not for you. But anyone who's ever said on a meme or anything else that, oh, this is this and that and the other, jujitsu is not for you. Speak for yourself. Send me those students. Come on, bro. <laughs> Take the students. <laughs> Send them to me. Send them to me, the ones who you can't keep because you don't know how to teach jujitsu in a way that is for everyone. That's all I ask. Don't say jujitsu is not for everyone because it's a lie. You're spreading misinformation. Jujitsu is for everyone. Your school is not for everyone. And all we're saying, and this is like what he was talking about, man, I talked to these other black belts and I give them advice. All we're saying is that if your school is running away where you don't feel like it's for everyone, maybe it's time to ask some questions. And if you're 17 years in and you have 120 students, 17 years, 120, you should have 300, 400 students at four years if you keep the people who walk in the door. So it's start time to ask the right questions if you're a school owner and you're not keeping the students the way that you'd like to. Fair? Fair. Let's ask more questions. Let's keep more students. And don't be putting memes up for anything but your school. Don't be putting a meme for jujitsu. You don't qualify to speak for all of jujitsu unless you're Eddie Gracie and Carlos Gracie or you're delivering the message for them as I'm doing right now.
Thank you, bro. Congratulations on the success. Peace, bro. See you guys soon. Dope. <laughs>